inhibitory protein that controls uh, the dendritic growth in the postsynaptic density of the nerve cell. And when uh, it is not growing or, or it's not regulated, it kind of shorts out and kills the messages between the neurons, uh, which inherently causes intellectual disability and uh, has also been linked to seizures. Um, 70 to 80 percent of our children have some type of epilepsy, and um, the intellectual disability ranges from mild all the way to severe. But, um, but kind of how I started on, on my journey, and I, I want to, uh, this, is, this is Beckett, and I know this is a big screen full of information, but um, Beckett is who started my journey um, through trying to find better treatments for him. We noticed, um, as Be Beckett actually is a twin and um, was not keeping up with the milestones that his twin sister uh, was reaching, and we noticed a, a noticeable difference at the age of four months. Uh, he was first uh, diagnosed with a developmental delay, and um, they actually suspected cerebral palsy because his motor coordination was off. And we went through uh, MRIs, CAT scans, but they all seemed to, to come out to be normal. Um, then as we progressed uh, you know, through seeing different specialists, we've, we actually saw 19 specialists before we got a diagnosis. And we went through several genetic tests, uh, such as the karyotype, the microarray, and the fragile X, Rett syndrome, uh, and all those uh, were, were, were normal. Some of the, the uh, other things that Beckett suffers from are from uh, sensory issues, such as uh, the food and temperature, motion, flashing lights, just, just anything would set him off. Um, he was late in developing all of his particular motor milestones. He finally sat up at 10 months, crawled at 16, and he walked at 22 months. And it wasn't until we met um, a, a developmental pediatrician and, this, and went through the autism, uh, um, uh, I guess the, uh, the, the, the whole um, test to, to find out where he was cognitively, his diagnostic uh, cognitive level. They finally sent us to genetics at Texas Children's, and he was actually the first um, patient at Texas Children's Hospital's genetics clinic to be identified with the SYNGAP1 mutation. And it, it was uh, a micro mutation or point mutation um, that ended up being a change in a nucleic, or a nucleic or nucleotide acid causing a codon stop, which caused the gene to tell it to stop making the protein. Um, he's mildly intellectual disability, and as you can probably see, as every acronym uh, there as a diagnosis, as a diagnosis, the ADHD, he has OCD, ODD, PDD, NOS, uh, speech language delay, and at the time he was four years old, uh, he had maybe 30 words or less. Well, as we continued through our journey, um, I there was no foundation, there was no uh, any type of resources. There was one paper actually that was um, published on this disorder basically saying that it caused intellectual disability. And as I tried to find resources for him to try to find a prognosis and better treatments, he actually uh, went unsuspecting, with unsuspected seizures for five years before he was diagnosed. And it took a 22-hour EEG to actually pick up his seizures, and um, uh, and I, it's uh, one of those things where they have what they call the silent seizures in this case that they believe that causes the um, uh, the destruction of uh, the the neurons in the brain, and they actually nicknamed this uh, particular gene mutation the learning gene or the memory gene. And um, as we continued throughout our journey and we figured out that he was having the absent seizures and the atypical frontal lobe type seizures, um, we finally controlled them with Lamictal. 
And of course, there are, some of our kids don't respond to that, but we realized that as science started to progress on our disorder, um, they make too much glutamate. And so a glutamate uptake or inhibitor actually helped control his seizures. And once we controlled the seizures, then his speech uh, started to progress. His um, sensory and his behaviors actually started to improve. And I, I've listed um, when he was seven, he's eight now, we've been controlling his seizures and some of his behavior with some of the medications listed there, like the clonidine and the Viarin. Well, as we were going through his journey um, and realized they didn't have any resources, I decided uh, with a group of uh, parents that had found me online as I was blogging, and we started uh, the organization uh, Bridge the Gap. And since then, within the last couple of years, we have um, really grown and made a lot of progress to get where we need to go to get treatments for, for these children. And the NIH actually recognized SYNGAP-1 as a newly um, uh, recognized rare uh, disease. And so since then, we've had a lot of attention on our disorder. And that's kind of uh, Beckett's story in a nutshell. And of course, he's still eight and our, our, our journey still continues. But as a foundation, uh, we have a desired impact uh, to be able to increase awareness, enabling cl clinicians to identify children earlier. Because we believe that because of these um, silent seizures, some of them, um, because they, they range from anywhere from the grand mal, the drop, the monoclonic, uh, and so on. We believe that these seizures, if they're caught early enough, can help prevent some of the damage that's being done in the brain. And so that's one of our, our biggest things is to try to catch these kids um, with, you know, that start off with global developmental delay and misdiagnosed for all these other, other issues to try to um, treat them earlier in life so that the damage isn't, isn't uh, as severe. So that's our desired impact as an organization. Um, we have four goals uh, that we would like to, to, um, uh, to achieve, and that's raising awareness of the SYNGAP-1 and trying to unite patient families together. And then we'd like to educate researchers and medical professionals uh, to get an early diagnosis. Um, we would like to create a behavioral medical protocol specifically for SYNGAP-1 since uh, there are so many of our kids, and it seems to be a trend, where they go uh, uh, undiagnosed with seizures because the seizures are not, not being caught on a one-hour EEG. And we would like to lengthen our set of protocol that if they are uh, diagnosed with SYNGAP-1, that they are monitored regularly uh, for seizures or put on a 22-hour, 12-hour EEG to try to see if we can uh, get those seizures under control. Because it seems if they go longer, until we get our patient registry up, uh, we, we believe that uh, it's going to be harder to control those seizures. Um, and also, we'd like to educate families and, and create a custom support program for those that will allow each of the children to have the best outcome available for their lives and, their, and to improve their quality of life. Um, several of our programs, in fact, I'm really excited. Uh, we are about to launch our first International Patient Registry and Natural History Study. We actually won the project with NORD, uh, National Organization of Rare Disease, and the FDA over the next five years. And we are already IRB approved. And uh, ho hopefully, we're going to be ready to launch to start collecting data within the next month. Um, and we plan on continuing our, uh, uh, our international SYNGAP conference. Uh, we are having our very first one that's being hosted by Baylor, Texas Children's, and Florida Scripps uh, on November the 30th and December 1st. And we're getting all the stakeholders together uh, to try to figure out the best uh, route to take to try to find treatments uh, to help these children. And then also uh, um, getting uh, to a place where we can start identifying 
um, more of these patients out in the community. Um, so that uh, right there, so if you're interested, there, we have an Eventbrite. We actually have very few seats limit. We have few seats left. So you, if you would like to attend, you, you probably need to register really quick because we're running out of seats. We have a, a limited number, which I guess is a good problem to have. And um, uh, very excited to be able to uh, have about, we have about 18, 19 speakers of scientists and clinicians from all over the world that are actually going to be there that study this and uh, we're all coming into one room uh, to, to really try to push some progress and accelerate. Um, and our future programs as an organization, uh, to be able to get more um, people interested in studying this, uh, we're, we are going to be raising money for a scholarship award for a postdoc that would be interested in um, studying uh, SYNGAP1 mutations. And then also we would like to plan more uh, family meetups and support for our families um, to help cope with some of the behaviors and, and um, that our children have and um, also become a, a stronger bonded community. So uh, that is that is pretty much what uh, I, I have going on. And if you have any questions or, or anything, feel free to reach out to me. Um, I have an open door policy. You can call me and email me for any, any kind of information. I'd be glad to share. Great. Thank you, Monica. Monica we appreciate your uh, time and this wonderful presentation on your nonprofit organization. And we'll make sure that your contact information is uh, given out after the webinar. Uh, it's, I think it really underscores the power of marketing and uh, social media uh, when the, you're able to connect a bunch of resources online uh, and able to uh, organize a nonprofit just from uh, some online conversations. So congratulations on that effort. Oh, thank you. At this point, uh, I'll go ahead and turn the presentation over to Dawn Laney, who's going to tell us a little bit more about thinkgenetic.com. Dawn? Great. Good. Can you guys see my slides? Yes. So, hi everybody. I'm really excited to come be able to speak with you today and with Monica in support of the My Beautiful Child project. I'm going to talk a little bit about this grand project that I've been pulled into over the past year and a half called Think Genetic. Um, first, I just want to put a little disclosure up here. This is just letting you know that I do a lot of work and research, and when you do that, then you go ahead and disclose your things. I'm also a co-founder of Think Genetic, and you'll understand more about that as we go through my presentation. <laughs> <laughs> so when you start right out, when you think about, uh, in my case, when I was in graduate school, when I was just a young warthog, um, I yeah. did my thesis on whether or not patients use the internet to find genetic information. Believe it or not, not everybody did. And part of that is because there wasn't much information out there. But there were a few forerunners. For example, the, the uh, ISMRD, which is a society working with manacidosis, had some great information out there. Um, but what I really focused on for my thesis was, how do you find good information? How do you make sure it's good information to give to your patients? And how do you develop counseling techniques when patients bring information to you from the internet? You know, can't, when somebody brings you information, you can't just say like, oh, that's, you know, that doesn't work and throw it out the window. You need to really address, you know, their need to go look for this information and figure out if there's places that you can really help using the information that's already had. I mean, we just heard the story of Mama Bear and Monica as she went <laughs> this journey of 19 specialists. Um, usually by the time someone gets to a genetic counselor, they've had to do a lot of research on their own. And it's, it's a... Um, technical minefield when you're going through and trying to figure out, you know, where they have their strongest feelings about pieces of information they've gathered. Well, if you fast forward to about, you know, in, since 2010, it's unthinkable that somebody wouldn't Google for health information after hearing about a possible diagnosis or Google health symptoms. I do it, you do it, we all do it. Um, and what they're looking for in most cases from this Pew Research poll was information on specific diseases, doctors, and health professionals. Who else is looking? Well, we're all looking to try to figure out what's going on with us, whether it's a genetic condition or an ear pain. And it's not just patients, like we heard from Monica. It's moms, it's dads, it's nurses, it's all the people who are caring for patients who have some medical issue that's rising up. And doctors do it too. <laughs> 
<laughs> if you don't know that your doctor sometimes Googles what's going on and finds good information online, this slide will tell you that, in fact, they do. Genetic counselors, too, I should add there. Now, when you Google, you can find some great information and some great resources. If you Googled SYNGAP1, you would find Monica support group, you'd find the great Nord entries on SYNGAP1, and you'd find a lot of um, kind of technical articles that are out there. And that is good information. But you also get websites that's entire goal is to pull in people to look at their ads. So you'll get maybe a little paragraph about the condition you're looking for, but you'll get six ads for some sort of skin cream that um, they're paying for space on that particular place. So we call them kind of like spam sites. So you get medical spam sites, you get nonspecific information. Sometimes you get awesome information that's so good, but how do you separate out the pieces? Well, I knew this as a genetic counselor intellectually, but uh, when I had my first child, as opposed to Monica's mom journey, I had a, a child journey. My dad uh, was diagnosed with a connective tissue disorder, but they didn't know which one. So he spent a lot of time Googling and bringing the information to me and looking for better information as he got near our diagnosis. And uh, we learned that the information out there is so broad, and sometimes you can find good information. But for several diseases, you can't find anything good that's for patients. And you can't find things that are good if you're a non-specialist in geneticists. Now, Monica's organization has done a great job of getting SYNGAP out there. So if you Google, the first 10 answers are actually pretty good. But if you Google for ARSCOG disease or ARSCOG syndrome, there is not a support group. There is not strong information. There are a few really great sites, um, but most of them are not targeted for patients. And my dad, being the information technology, information gathering type of guy, he said, we're not just going to complain. We're going to do something about it. And what he did is he is an IBM business partner, applied to get access to what's in the supercomputer. I don't know if you guys know Watson, but Watson was on Jeopardy, and it beat the other humans out. And uh, my dad was very impressed by this. And I was too, because if we could harness the power of all this big interactive information, and if we could use the power of cognitive computing and all these technological advances that we do for other things, why can't we use that to help patients? Why can't we go to the people who actually need the help most? And that's where we started. We started with Think Genetic. And the point of Think Genetic is to be interactive. So when you're Googling at midnight, um, you actually get answers to the questions you would like an answer to. So that may be something as simple as, you know, um, can I get a tattoo if I've got hemophilia? Or it may be as complicated as, you know, where is the clinical trial that can help my child? I can't find anything in the US. Is it, there's the one in Italy. You know, just trying to find the right resources, who can help you, what are the next steps, and then answers to questions. So this is kind of a labor of love, if you will. Um, the goals are that we're going to be free, independent, and trustworthy. We're going to be updated. Uh, it's going to be interactive, so you're getting the answers you want. And most of all, to help patients, families, and caregivers. Now, as an added bonus, we actually are going to help doctors who are not specialized in genetics as well, because they actually could use the same information that patients, families, and caregivers can. How do we do it? Well, <laughs> myself and hundreds of my genetic counselor friends have trained IBM's Watson. And if you can imagine, training a supercomputer in any topic can be pretty daunting. So we take bite-sized chunks. We started with conditions that are treatable, conditions that are found on newborn screening testing, conditions that are lysosomal storage diseases, because that's my clinical interest. Let's face it, I have some, you know. <laughs> some stake in those diseases. Uh, and we looked at diseases that are frequently popping up on um, other panels like the microarray. Uh, and as Monica said, there's, there's conditions all the time being newly recognized, conditions that are found through various testing methodologies that range from everything that EGL does to everything that might be found in a research lab. So um, not only do we have genetic counselors writing all sorts of content and training Watson, we partner with support and advocacy groups like SYNGAP with Bridge the Gap. Um, and that's been a really strong way to do it because who knows what people need? Well, the people who have the condition or are working with people with the condition, the moms, the dads, the sisters, the brothers, the brothers and sisters, you know, the people who are actually in the trenches. And by partnering with support groups and having them look at our information, they can tell us that's important, that's not. You need to emphasize this more. This is how people are asking questions now. And that really helps us make Watson able to answer questions better on Think Genetic. 
And then we also partner with genetic testing laboratories like Emory Genetics Laboratory. We partner with educational programs. And we've partnered with some pharmaceutical companies who really want to get good educational resources information out there in the world. And this is just an example. One of our, our strong partners is Genetic Alliance, who has done amazing information out there on the internet about everything from newborn screening to different genetic conditions. Um, and by partnering, we've been able to really do some cool things on both sides. One of the other things that we're doing is trying to decrease that diagnostic odyssey. That's what we call it when Monica and Beckett went to 19 doctors. We call that the diagnostic odyssey. Because like Homer, you're traveling from place to place just trying to get yeah. home, a home that's your medical home, a home where you can think about finding your buddies and doing a support group. Um, and what we've come up with is something called Symptom Matcher. And we've made it for people, just the average people. This is not for doctors. I mean, they could use it if they wanted to, but that's not what we wrote it for. And what you do is you tell us by poking on a, a drawing of what problems are you having. Is it something you can see, like you've got a really strange ear? Is it something you feel like a big bad headache all the time or a tingling pain in your hands and feet? Or is it a test that your doctor told you about, like you've got agenesis the corpus callosum? You may not know exactly what that is, but you, in your head you go, oh, okay, that's, that means the baby's brain didn't divide into two halves it's supposed to. So we took all those medical terms that you hear and put it into normal words. So you can see here, um, fingers don't open and close, crooked little finger. So instead of saying clinodactyly, we're saying you've got a crooked little finger. And from that, it pulls you down into some possible diagnoses through some questions we're going to ask, some questions that we're going to give you, and then responses that you give. And from that, we're trying to help people have some direction they can take to their doctors in a non-obnoxious way, right, <laughs> that you can say, look, this is what this Think Genetics site told me based on these symptoms, and we're going to list them all out. And when I read through some stories that patients shared, this out of these five makes sense, but what do you think? And by that way, maybe you can get to genetics faster instead of, you know, winding your way through everybody from ENT to endocrinology. Maybe genetics could be the fourth doctor. I mean, I'm mm -hmm. not going to say it's going to be the first, but, you know, you could definitely shorten that odyssey a bit. And these are the kind of, I'm just showing you a little screenshots that tell you a little bit of what Think Genetic looks like right now. This is our beta, so it's out there and you could use it at any time, but it doesn't have all the diseases we want in there. We've got 200 diseases up right now. So it's just an example of how Think Genetic is very practical from our perspective. As a genetic counselor, I'm a very practical person. I want to tell people, you know, what are directions they can take now. So here, somebody says, well, how do I get tested for it? And often you'll hear, like, go to your doctor and ask for it. Well, we're going to tell you, yes, go to your doctor and ask for it, but you need to think about what it means for you. You need to think about um, how do you reach resources if you get tested, and who are the people who can order up that test for you. And you can see here we do have Emory Genetics Laboratories add a little add-on here because they test for Fabry disease. So that would be another option is to click over there, look at what the Fabry testing is, and take it to your doctor. This is our friends over at uh, Bridge the Gap. How do I find a Syngap1 support group? Well, there you go. Here they are. Here's their website. Go see them. <laughs> and you can see underneath that something very interesting that pops up, which is called Common Questions. And that's things that you might be asking about in addition to what you actually asked me. Because sometimes when you're looking up something, you don't know which questions you're asking. You're asking, hey, is there a treatment for this? But you don't know that you also might want to know if there's a clinical trial available. So that's the kind of things we look at, um, trying to be very practical about it. And this is one of those just normal living questions. I've got cystic fibrosis. Does it make more sense for me to get a dog or a cat? <laughs> it's kind of a strange question, but this is something that people want to know about, uh, more normal life kind of questions. So we think this is an innovative use of um, educational because we want to make it smart and learning, and that's the Watson piece. We want to make it free because we want people to all be able to access it. And we want to make something that patients and providers could also use. And we want to make it work in the middle of the night so that people have better questions when they get to the doctor and have a better understanding of what's going on. Because patients and their family members and caregivers are the people who are most invested in trying to figure things out. Unfortunately, in our world, when you're a healthcare provider, you're limited in the amount of time you could spend in a room with someone before somebody starts getting grumpy at you and telling you that you've got to see more patients. Um, so if, if there can be a way that patients and healthcare providers work together and provide each other with resources, I think that's all much the better. So that's what we're looking at. So we'd say, if you have questions, come visit us. If you've got comments, 
definitely make them because this is the early learning stages of what we're doing. Um, and this is just, it, it's kind of entertaining because I put up in Facebook uh, something about Think Genetic, and one of my good friends from high school put it on her Facebook page. And immediately, one of her good friends, who's a nurse practitioner, went and looked at Think Genetic because she had just been tested uh, on a carrier panel. And uh, she really liked what she found. So that, for me, just tells me that we're headed in the right direction and that you know, what we're doing is not just something that we're doing for our family, but something that can really help a lot of people. Um, we're always looking for new partners. So if there's uh, someone who's listening who's part of a support group and feels like this might be useful to them, the easiest way to contact us is there's on every page of answers, there's a contact Think Genetic form, or you could always just email me, of course. Um, and our biggest mission is that genetics comes foremost. So we, say, we have a t-shirt we say, nobody puts genie in a corner, which is our way of saying, don't forget genetics. You know, when you're trying to figure out what their health problem is, it's not always genetic, but let's think about it. Um, so that's our, our overall mission. Uh, Think Genetic began uh, through some educational grants and some educational research grants. So the legacy of Angel Foundations has, always, has been a huge, huge help to us. Um, they focus on education about Crabbe disease and cystic fibrosis. And um, they've really believed in our mission from the beginning. And then Pfizer and Shire are two pharmaceutical companies who, um, when we applied for research funds to learn more about how people look at information and how patients use the internet. They provided us with the grant funding there. And then um, on that same line, helping and helping, I have a graduate student who's doing research. And if anybody's interested and has a, a family, living with a genetic condition or a family member, it would be great if you'd fill out her survey, because that helps us learn more about how people ask questions and also will help her get her data for her, her uh, thesis, which is due next May. <laughs> She's got some time. And uh, this is my contact information. And if you're ever interested in watching the whole moth-style founding story of Think Genetic, uh, we were at a foundation benefit. And we, for our talent show, my two siblings and I gave talked about the founding of Think Genetic. So thanks for your time. And if you have any questions, I guess we can look at those now. Thank you, Dawn. <laughs> was a very informative presentation on Think Genetic. Uh, and again, we'll circulate your contact information as well as Monica's uh, in an email following this presentation. At this point, I'd like to open the uh, floor to questions that the audience may have. Um, we do have a couple that have already come in. Um, I think this first one was uh, targeted for Monica. I think they were asking for you to repeat when your patient registry is going to go live. Our patient registry, we're planning to go live, I'm hoping, by mid-November. Uh, we just got our IRB approval, and we are, um, we're shoring up some you know, paperwork right now, but it should be up and live, I'm hoping, probably by the second week of November. Great. Now, one question I, actually is, is my question. <laughs> you, uh, Monica, have gone through a, a number of steps from the 19 clinicians that you had contacted about your uh, son's condition um, all the way through having your own nonprofit. And there's obviously a lot of steps that go in between there. Um, you know, being a mother of a child impacted by a very rare disease and at the time having very limited resources available to you, you know, how were you able to, uh, you know, get so much attention from, you know, organizations like the National Organization for Rare Disease, NORD, um, the FDA. Um, I'm just curious what drove, um, you, you know, you able to build a nonprofit based on a few social media uh, conversations you had? Um, well, let's, where do I start? <laughs> um, I actually started blogging. Um, I have my own personal blog that I use to um, tell my son's story. That's kind of how it started. Uh, and I just kind of... I dove in head first. I went to the bank, got a loan. I found a great CPA in, in Atlanta, Georgia, who did all my paperwork for me. Um, got a group of motivated, uh, we started out with, with uh, parents uh, to start our organization. And I, I kind of just hit, hit the ground running. I, I, I guess I have, um, our, our kids, the, the way that their disorder is, it's, it's, it, it doesn't necessarily um, get worse, 
but it can get worse because of the seizures, I guess, on the opposite hand. So I just felt the urgency. I mean, I needed to get something done, and I went out there, um, and I emailed anyone who had listened to me. And pretty much, I guess I have an attitude of, I'm not going to take no for an answer. <laughs> And and we need, if I if someone couldn't answer the question then I then I just researched and found someone who could help me and I think I like with the NIH the first year that we started I just gathered up as much research as possible uh, from any researcher from all over the world from Japan Australia Europe here in the United States and I sent it to the NIH and um, and. You know, we, 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 we looked at it all, and they looked at it all, and I guess we hit the jackpot because we ended up having t uh, monozygous twins in Belgium uh, for the disorder. One, one actually is mosaic for it, and the other one actually has the, the full-fledged, uh, what they call syndrome in Europe. It's not, they haven't adopted the word syndrome here in the U.S. yet, but it's called Syngap syndrome in Europe. And um, that's kind of what, what set us off. I, I just kind of, and I started promoting it. I, I we got I got a marketing company to do some logos logos for me um, um, for free, and um, just kind of put myself out there. I I, I was like kind of like no shame, <laughs> and uh, I don't believe you can tweet too much, post too much because it it only helps get get the word out. And I, I think that's what I did. I used social media as an advantage um, to try to get the word out. I'm sure that if people are online all the time, they probably get sick of my posts, but I'm like, oh, well. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's great, Monica. I think, uh, you know, you, you touched on some really interesting points there, the, the power of social media and the number of conversations that can come up in a Google result, um, as Dawn also alluded to a little bit, can really drive, uh, you know, the people to resources and education and the more conversations happening the higher the Google results are I can speak to that as a marketer um, so certainly your efforts have paid off and that you've created an organization for a very rare disease and so again congratulations on that oh, thank you. Um, Dawn I think we have a couple questions for you I think um, one of them has to do with uh, you mentioned earlier that uh, patients can kind of go on and see frequently asked questions and it creates sort of a packet of information for them on what to talk to their clinician about. Is there actually like a, a printout there or is there a way for them to get in touch with the genetic counselor? What if they don't have a clinician? Yeah, so there are a couple different things that touches upon. If you, when you go to the symptom matcher, it is not yet live. It's behind the scenes, but it's, it'll be up before um, the end of the year. Uh, that will, yes, have something you can print out and take to your doctor. It'll be a one-pager. It'll be simple. It'll give next steps, but enough information that your doctor understands why the, the symptom matcher thought you would go in there. So there will be a physical printout there. And we're working on um, printouts from our question and answers so you can pick out specific things and do them in a printable fashion. But in the meantime, you can save all the answers that you like. So if you log in and have an actual profile, then you can save your searches, you can save your questions, you can save your answers, and all that will be there for you when you return. And then when it comes to not having a provider, in many, many of our answers we tell you how to find a provider for your area, but you can also um, to help find a provider not for actual genetic counseling. There's an Ask the Genetic, genetic Counselor or Ask a Think Genetic Counselor slot, and you can email them, tell us where you are, tell us what you're thinking about, and we'll hook you up with the resources that you need. And it's interesting because we're getting a lot of questions there from international. So I, I'll get, um, I got, I think it was last week, there was someone whose child had nori disease and they lived in Spain and they were trying to find somewhere in Europe where there were specialists in nori disease or any clinical trials. Um, and then I also got another one from a woman who had another rare condition who was uh, in Greece. And so it's interesting. We're really seeing people using that as a way to connect to the resources they need. So you've got your automatic ones you can do when I'm asleep. And then you, if you don't find what you need, you can always use the Ask the Think Genetic Counselor. And that'll be answered within a couple of days. Great. Um, another question that came up, which I think actually can go to both Monica and Dawn. Um, mm -hmm. Someone was curious about your greatest success story since you've uh, started this. So maybe we can start with Monica. What has been your greatest success since you started your nonprofit? 
I, I think the greatest success uh, so far is actually being recognized as not just a gene mutation, but we, I guess, when they put it down as an official disorder, um, that, that it, it does cause what it says it causes, that, of course, as a mom, I'm looking at my child going, I know I'm not crazy. I know, you know, and, and yet you see all these children. So when they recognized it as an official rare disease and put it on that list, um, it, it, really, it really spoke volumes. It, it made our, our claims as, as credible. Um, uh, and, and it's making it easier to get the attention of professionals because honestly, you know, I have no research to, to even back this up, but I believe that this particular uh, gene mutation, SYNGAP1, um, is not just causing our, our children's disorder, but I really do believe it's going to be a crossover into many other different uh, um, related disorders. Um, and um, I believe our, our children are just the, the cornerstone to that. I, I think it's going to be a lot bigger. and. Um, um, that's probably my, the biggest success story uh, so far as an organization speaking. And then also, I have to say, there's one more. I can't believe we won the NORD and the FDA grant for this natural history study. It was like, I think I, I was happened to be teaching school at the time because I did quit my job teaching to do this full time. Uh, but I think I ran down the hall of my school just looking for someone to tell. I felt like I was like Steve Martin and the jerk going, I am somebody. So it was just, <laughs> it was just like, oh my God, you know. Uh, so it, it, uh, that those, those two things, I think, would happen to be, be, huge successes for us because I believe this is going to accelerate uh, where we need to go to get to better treatments and possibly a cure. I, I, I you know, my science, one of my scientists was able to reverse the effects of, of uh, the gene in mice uh, within a window of time. And so, you know, that gives us hope. Um, but um, but those, those are kind of my two big things. <laughs> Great. Thank you. Dawn? Like Monica, I cannot pick just one. I <laughs> think there's, there's multiple facets of what goes on uh, with Think Genetic in my life. And I think the first success that I recognized was the first time we were up and someone took a look at the site and said, yes, thank you. This is what we needed. Because that told me that we had this great idea, and really, it is filling a gap that's needed. Really, it is something that people want and something that will be useful. So it was kind of a validation that all this work we've put into it has really ended up where we wanted to be, which is helping helping people, helping patients. The second great success was, you know, with a company like Think Genetic, we have the ability to access Watson, um, but and we have educational grants that started us out, but after that, you've got to fund yourself. And I think my biggest success story in that regard was we did a Kickstarter campaign, and we were working really hard to get the word out. And um, you know, people really have to buy into your idea and give small amounts of money for that thing to succeed. And when we reached our goal in the Kickstarter campaign for Think Genetic, I was so excited because, again, it was again validating like this is something that people need and want, and they're willing to put their twenty dollars where their mouth is. So. That was my two giant exciting events that I would have to say for my successes. And those are both great answers. And I think, you know, following on both of your points, I'd like to share a comment at this time from one of the attendees. Um, this person noted, I'm just a parent, which we all know is not a simple task, but I'm just a parent, but I am beside myself with this. Beside myself, exclamation point. This is amazing. I have been wandering around in the dark, bumping into walls for over five years with our daughter and we are no closer to a diagnosis than we were in the beginning. This is huge. So I think that comment really kind of underscores the importance of resources like Bridge the Gap and Think Genetic in addressing sort of not only the educational need um, for various rare diseases, but also just promoting a community of conversation. 
um, to, you know, for many people, they are still lost in the journey of finding a diagnosis. As Monica noted, it took 19 specialists to get to the end of her diagnostic odyssey. So I think, you know, the more programs we do like this, the more conversations had online and the more resources like Bridge the Gap and Think Genetic, um, you know, hopefully we're shortening the diagnostic odyssey for some folks. Thank you for your comment. Thank you. I just want to give you a big hug. <laughs> a virtual yeah. hug. You made me cry. <laughs> yep. I'm with I, you. I, uh, okay, yeah, so. because you just got to have that tenacity. Just keep going. Don't stop. You know, uh, even though days are hard, you, you just got to keep going. It's You're going to find that. You're going to find it. it. Just don't ever stop. That That would be my suggestion. Okay. And then let's see, uh, and that person responded back, I'll take a big hug. I'm sitting here crying as well. <laughs> uh, nine specialists. This looks like what that person's journey has been. So uh, certainly, and, and Dawn, certainly as a clinical genetic counselor, you know how often, you know, patients come to you and patients' families come to you after they've seen many, many specialists. So I think we can all appreciate, um, you know, the, the frustration and the complexity of that journey. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, and then somebody else chimed in. Oh, we see where this is the beauty of this uh, this type of resource is so much agreement and a sense of community, even when things are still a little bit in the unknown in some cases. Another person commented, I understand 14 years living with the unknown for us hmm. uh, until we received a diagnosis. All right. Thank you for the comments. If there's no other questions at this time, I don't know if Monica or Dawn, if you have any ending thoughts, it sounds like we've covered many of the bases. And again, I'll circulate your information and ways to get in contact with both Bridge the Gap and Think Genetic after this call. Well, I, I'm, I'm appreciative that, that uh, I got to, to tell a little bit of my story and that I, I really do. I, I have an open door. I, it's not just about my disorder, but I'm a big believer in um, helping anybody try to find their way because I've been there. I, you know, when you're lost, when you feel lost. So I, I, if I don't know the answer, I will try to find somebody uh, that does. And so I'm, I'm open to, to that uh, for, from anyone. Thank you, Monica. I'm right there with you. Same, same. <laughs> <laughs> we have, a, we have a lot of alignment on our present, our panelists today. So that's great. Well, thank you everybody for joining us, and thank you to Monica and Dawn again for your wonderful presentations with these great resources that um, are only going to improve the genetics community that uh, is so complex to navigate. Um, you've certainly made it easier with your resources. So thank you everyone again, and have a wonderful rest of your day. Have a great day too. Thank you. Goodbye everybody. Bye-bye.